right, so that was last week in the book of Ephesians, and the week before that we were in the book of Ephesians, and the week before that we were in the book of Ephesians. Anyone want to guess where we are this week? Wrong. We're not in Ephesians this week. <clears throat> I'll explain that in just a minute. Um, first of all, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, when I first started off in ministry, I worked with children a whole lot, and we, we used to, um, at the end of the, the little kids' service, we'd have a time for them to give, and we'd pass around the cup, and they'd put in their, their monies, you know, and one day at the end, some of the leaders brought me over, and they said, we want, we want you to see what, what Colin put in, and Colin was about three or four years old, and they, they brought out a couple little coins, and they were tokens from Chuck E. Cheese, and uh, Colin gave all he could give. He, he really, he, he, was, he wasn't trying to be funny or anything. He didn't know the difference between any of the money. He, he knew there's a, this is something that, that belongs to me. It's money, and I want to give it to the church. He, ha, he had the right heart about it. And that, that heart can continue on through adulthood. It really can. And it can start in adulthood. And I, I'm reminded of somebody like John Wesley, the, the famous um, evangelist, famous missionary. And John Wesley, he... At some point in his life, he said, you know what? Here's a, moder a modest income. Here's an amount of money I can live off of. Lord, whatever you give me beyond this amount of money, I'm going to give away. And they said by the end of his life, uh, he ended up every year giving away the equivalent of about $140,000. Uh, living off of somewhere around, I, they said $20,000, but that was before inflation. So it must have been closer to thirty or $40,000 now. Uh, <clears throat> but the point is... This generous giving spirit, where does it come from? Now, there are certainly generous non-Christians in this world. There's no denying that. But Christians ought to be the most generous people, and they tend to be the most generous people statistically. Why is that? What is it uh, that is in interwoven in the Christian faith that makes us want to give? Most easily explained in the famous passage, John 3, 16. Right? For God so loved the world that he did what? He gave. He gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This is this idea that, that we who belong to Christ, that we have this eternal life through Jesus Christ, our, our Savior, right, who saved us from our sins, we understand that he is a gift and that everything God has given us is a gift so we're made to be like God. We're not, we're not giving so that we can be like God. We have been remade in God's image through Christ so we live in a way that honors God, who is a giving God. We also see in Hebrews 12, verse 28, but, uh, because of what Christ has done that we read about in the early, earlier in chapter 12, therefore let us be grateful for receiving something we've been given a kingdom that cannot be shaken and since we have this kingdom that cannot be shaken let us offer to god acceptable worship with reverence and awe it's part of who we are we because we belong to christ we have been given everything so we seek to give now this is a this is a rare time for me y'all know that normally i take a book of the bible and i just preach verse by verse through that book well this is a one-off sermon and can you guess what the sermon's about today giving that's right somebody said tithing we're gonna deal with tithing giving uh, and uh why today why are we talking about giving today and the short version is that it's it's just time it's just time back in the spring it's like April or May that the, the elders were sitting around. We were talking, said, you know what? At some point, we should probably give a sermon on giving, help people understand why we do it, how we do it. I said, but you know what? We don't want to rush this. We don't want to jump out there and try to do it on our own time. We started looking at dates. We looked at all the stuff we had going on through the summer and everything. We said, you know what? Prayerfully, October 15th looks like a good day. And does anybody know what today is? It's October 15th. And so this is the day that it just happened to land that we are going to be talking about giving. And every time as a pastor I start talking about giving, I can feel the, uh, the skepticism seeping in, seeping in here. 
And I can feel people that say, I knew it. And I knew it. Is this how long it took? He's been here eight months. Now he's going to, pa- these greedy pastors are always trying to get into my pocketbook. And, and let me just go ahead right off the bat and say, if that's you, first of all, I understand that. I've been burned by churches before. I've been burned by pastors before. Um, and, and if there's a check in your spirit, if, you're, if you don't have peace with the idea of giving to this church or to a local church, then just don't. All right, I'll just tell you, and it's not a trick, just right off the bat, you can just take that off your plate, forgive about, forget about it, you don't have to give here, I'm not asking you to forgive here, I'm not here to beg for your money. Um, so just sit back and I just want you to hear. I want you to hear how good it is to give. And not just to give to anything, but to give the way God says we should give, to give into the local church. It really is a blessing, and I can tell you, Honestly, in, in my life, I've sought, in, in my family's life, we have sought to be generous in what God has put in our hands. And it, it has not made me a rich man, but what it has done is that it has given me the peace of the Lord in my, in my life, and it's given me a faith that can't be bought. So there's no amount of money somebody can offer me to give up on what the Lord has, has given me because money doesn't, doesn't rule me. That's by design. That's what giving to the Lord does. Is it helps you remember who's boss. It's not my bank account. And Christians throughout history have felt that same way. And I hope today, everybody in here, I hope everybody listening to this will agree on that idea that, uh, that giving is good because our God is good. And those of us who belong to him, we have been given everything. So we're just, we're just following in his footsteps. It's not about money. It's about who we are. Now, today, like I said, normally I'd have a book of the Bible. I'd say, open it up, and we're going to look at that particular passage in that particular book. But because today's different, uh, we we decided to have a little mercy on you, and uh, we gave you a QR code on the screen here because I'm going to be going through so many different passages throughout. It's going to be kind of a doctrinal uh, overview. So if you want to, you can get your phone out, scan this code. If you scan this code, it'll give you all the passages that we're going to be going through today. You'll have them there on your phone. We are going to put them up on the screen as we go through there. Uh, don't worry, we're going to leave that QR code up there for a minute if some of y'all are still getting to your phones. <clears throat> and uh, that'll be helpful. Of course, it'll be helpful later if you want to go back and review some of the passages that we went through. Uh, before we go any further, let's just stop and pray. If you're scanning the code, continue to do what you're doing. We can, you can do that and pray. Lord, we thank you, God, that we can come to you and, and look at just this picture of giving throughout your word. And Lord, even as we think about going through your word this way, uh, I pray for guidance. God, I pray that you would help us to be cautious, not to draw anything from scripture that's not there. I pray you help us to see rightly, and I pray you help us to see the big picture of giving. Lord, that, it's, that it is not just behavior modification it's not just things that we do um, because that's what good people are supposed to do but it's something that we do for deeper reasons because it teaches us something about who you are and who we are and how we relate to you guide us this day in jesus name amen so there's some issues with giving even for people who believe in christ and even for people who believe that giving is good and giving to the local church is good there's some issues And that is that uh, it can be hard. (laughs) Giving can be a difficult thing, even for the most faithful among us. So what we're going to look at today, and kids, y'all can take note, uh, three obstacles, three obstacles to giving. And then we're going to see at the end why it is so good to give, even in spite of these obstacles. So those are some things you can talk to your parents on the way home about, the three obstacles and then why it's still good to give. First obstacle is this. uh, We don't know why or how to give. We don't know why or how to give. Did we get that up there? We'll work. We're, y'all, I, I put the sound booth there on overdrive today. All right, I told them to limber up a little bit before we get into this because I've just given them so much to work through. So there we go. Uh, obstacle one, we don't know how or why to give. When I was in college, uh, I was your typical broke college student, <clears throat> and I was growing in my faith as a Christian for the first time. I was really growing. And as I was growing as a Christian, I wanted to 
uh, get closer to the Lord. I wanted to be a, a greater participant in what the Lord was doing, so I wanted to give. The problem was I was not part of any kind of local church or anything. Again, I told you I was growing. That would come later. And so I didn't know what to do. I just know I wanted to do something. So it was late one night, and I, had, I opened up my wallet. I said, okay, God, I'll give you whatever's in my wallet. Wouldn't you know it? I opened up. It was $20. Like, oh, couldn't, couldn't have been a, a $1 bill in there. Uh, $20 was a lot of money to me at that time. And so I went, and I, I started driving around campus. I found an, a, a campus Christian organization, and I went, and I just went around to see if any of the doors were open. There was nobody there. I found one door open. I walked in. Everything was dark in there. I found a table sitting in a hallway, and I threw my $20 down on the table and left. <clears throat> Not the right way to give. Right heart, I wanted to give to the Lord, but I, you know, I was completely ignorant. I didn't know what to do. Later on, I started opening scripture and studying, and I realized, oh, okay, God does tell us how we should give. You see, a, a primary understanding that we must grasp as Christians is not just that God wants, it's, it's not just that we worship. He does want us to worship, but he also cares how we worship, how we do things. Thankfully, he's given us tons of instruction. So we're going to start with the Old Testament. How do we give according to the Old Testament? All right, here we go. We got them all up here. First of all, we, and I went ahead and put them all up uh, to, to try to, to help us flow through this a little better. First, God requires a tithe, and this is the first 10% of what we make. So if we look in Deuteronomy 14, verse 22, it says, You shall tithe all the yield of your seed that comes from the field year by year. So that word tithe in the Hebrew, it literally means 10%. And this is an agrarian society. They did have money at this time, but their main source of income was what they grew and what they brought in. So when you bring in your seed, when you bring in your crop, you take 10% of it and you give it to the Lord. Um, what 10% are you supposed to give to the Lord? The first 10%. Uh, Proverbs 3, verse 9, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. So you bring the first 10%. That's where we get that. That's where we get the idea of a tithe from, from passages like that. Now, second, we see that tithes are to go in the Lord's house. <clears throat> in Malachi chapter 3, the, uh, uh, God is speaking to the nation of Israel. Now, keep in mind, we're in the Old Testament, okay? <clears throat> He's speaking to the nation of Israel, and he says in verse 10, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. So it's this idea, it's supposed to be a collective work. A collective work of God's people bringing in God's blessings together to be used. Again, as a young Christian, now I'm growing, I found a local church, I've become a part of it, I want to give, I want to be faithful, I want to do everything I'm supposed to do. I start looking around at the church, and I'm like, you know what? These pews are nicer than any couch I have in my house. Uh, this, this, you know, the, the, all the stuff we have, these people have way more money than, than other people I see. So what I did was I started taking my paycheck, and I, I took my 10% of my paycheck, and I would just carry it around with me and just try to help people I saw out in the world. Again, right heart, wrong method, all right? Because I learned later on, I was like, you know, there's no accountability here. I could do whatever I wanted to with this money. Uh, I, I could invest, even, even unknowingly, I could give to harmful situations and harmful people. And I looked around and I said, you know what? In, in addition to that, this local church can take my $1 and do so much more with it than I can do. And they have wise elders and pastors that can look into this and see how God's money can be best spent. And so that's when I realized, oh, you're supposed to bring your money in together, to pool together. Um, and that's true today. I mean, th throughout history, the church has been able to do so much more with, with a dollar than one faithful Christian with a dollar. We're supposed to be working together. And we're going to get to why that is in just a second. Um, so you bring it into the Lord's house. Then you see also in Malachi, failure to tithe is robbing God. If the tithes are supposed to be brought into God's house, 
and you don't bring them into God's house, it's robbing God. Verse 8 of Malachi 3, will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and your contributions. So God, uh, he, he is, again, he's not, he doesn't just care that we worship. He cares how we worship. He cares how we do these things. But the flip side of that, failure to tithe is robbing God, but tithing brings the Lord's blessings. So still in Malachi 3, verse, verse 10, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Understand something that's happening here, because this is going to help us come to this great conclusion about Old Testament giving. He's talking about pouring out blessings on you. He's not necessarily talking about the individual, though we're going to see that exists. He's talking about the people, the people of God. So in verse 12 of Malachi 3, then all nations, when he, when he pours out on you, then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. You see this? God, God never gives us blessings so that we can simply hoard them onto ourselves and say, mine, 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 right? He gives us blessings from the beginning so that we can be a blessing so that's the idea we're bringing things together so that we can bless other people with them so all the way from the beginning god's blessings so that we can bless uh we see this idea continued on in um back to proverbs we see proverbs 11 <clears throat> Verse 24, one gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessings will be enriched, and one who waters will himself be watered. We see the same idea earlier in Proverbs 3. We already looked at verse 9, but in verse 10. So, um, so in verse 9, you honor your, the Lord with your first fruits. In verse 10, then your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will be bursting with wine course this is coming out of the famous passage in proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6 that says trust in the lord with all your heart lean not on your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths you get this idea you're trusting in god with your wealth and as you trust in god with your wealth he entrusts you with wealth so that others can be blessed through you and your faithfulness uh that brings us to number five. Tithing is a matter of trust in the Lord. Psalm 4, verse 5. Sorry, Psalm, yeah, Psalm 4, 5. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. You get the idea here. The concept of tithing, um, in, in case somebody wants to make this argument, oh, well, tithing is just something that came about with the Mosaic Covenant. We're not under the Mosaic Covenant anymore, so we don't have to worry about being generous. Well, tithing took place before the Mosaic Covenant. We see it in Genesis 14 when Abraham gave a tithe to the mysterious priest king Melchizedek that we talked about in Hebrews. There's tithe there. And lastly, we learn about Old Testament tithing is that um, it's, uh, it's not... It, it, it's not just tithing. It's tithes and offerings. And whatever you give and above, your tithes are offerings. So like we have, a, the, the Wooten family has a certain amount of money that we decide to give regularly to the church. But then some other stuff may come up. And we're like, you know what? We, we love that. And we want to give to that. Annie Armstrong, Easter offering, right? For North American missionaries. Lottie Moon, Christmas offering. Wait, is that right? I get those two mixed up. Annie Armstrong, Christmas offering. You get it opportunities to give i'm a southern Baptist. i'm supposed to know those i always get the two mixed up um we get opportunities to give more there's other places outside this church uh people we know who run ministries who say we think this is a great god honoring ministry and we we're excited to be able to give to that to see the gospel taken other places in this world those are offerings over and above our tithes we don't take away from what we're giving to the local church um we give in addition to as the lord has blessed us uh and it's just it's great it, it's it's you know Y'all are going to think I'm insane if you're not used to this, but um, it's, it's fun. It's actually fun. 
to see what God's put in your hands and to see the ways you can use it for God's kingdom. This is all Old Testament stuff, and why, why is this? Right? Remember back, back in Malachi, we said uh, this is God talking to his people. And throughout the Old Testament, to understand the Old Testament pro- uh, properly, you have to understand the idea of a covenant. And when you look at Israel in the Old Testament, you look at God's covenant people. God made a promise to these people. I will be your God and you will be my people. You see that phrase over and over and over through the Old Testament. So what you're looking at is not just God handing down this impersonal, detached commandment to the world. He's saying, no, I've I've drawn you to myself and I love you and I'm going to care for you and you're going to be the agents of my blessing in this world. Live as you have been called. Live as you have been called. That's God talking to Old Testament Israel, but I want you to hold on to that idea because it's going to, it's going to apply to us in just a minute. So when you take an Old Testament idea and you move it over to the New Testament, something happens. It's what we call escalation. So it goes from the Old Testament idea, there's correlation between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and in the correlation there's escalation. So it raises the bar. So the Old Testament, you have this idea of tithing, but when you get to the New Testament, there is no tithing. There's no mention of tithe in the New Testament. All right, so that's what you got for the first when we get to the New Testament. There you go. Instead, what do you have in the New Testament? Instead of tithing, it just says, be joyous and generous. All right, give generously and joyously. 2 Corinthians 9 the Apostle Paul says to the church in Corinth, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, which is why I started the sermon the way I did. If, there's, if you feel bitter, if you're upset, God doesn't want your dirty money. <laughs> you can keep your bitter money to yourself. If you you have a problem with the church, just hold on to it. Work your issues out with the church. And then when you give, give joyously. Give generously as you have decided in your heart. For God loves a cheerful giver. That's the idea. That's the New Testament idea of giving. We can continue on from there. You should give generously. Because we saw that. Verse 3, number 3. You should give for God's glory and not for your own glory. So we see... In Matthew uh, chapter 6, as Jesus is talking to the hypocrites, and y'all seen people like this, when they give, they got to make sure everybody knows, everybody knows how generous they are. And Jesus says, but when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. You get the idea? So, we're not tithing. Instead, we're giving joyously and generously. We're giving secretively, right? It's, it's not like you, you have to be cloak and dagger, be doing detective work so nobody ever finds out how much you give. You're just not announcing it, okay? Don't make a big deal out of yourself. Make a big deal out of God. And so when we talk about this New Testament idea of giving joyously and generously, naturally you say, well, how much is that? How much money should I give? And, and, the, and the, the, the freedom here is that I don't have to give you a percentage. I don't have to say, okay, you better make sure you give this amount. Um, but what I can do for you, just to help you wrap your mind around it, I give you a rule of thumb. A good rule of thumb, since they were doing it in the Old Testament, why don't you just start with 10%? 10% is enough where you're not going to go hungry, but it's going to remind you. You know what it's going to remind you? It's going to remind you that you, the bank does not own you, okay? It's going to remind you that all these ads you get on your social media that tells you you have to buy this to look better, you have to buy this to feel better, you have to give me your money if you want the right kind of life, and you step up and you say, uh-uh, I'm not owned by, my, by finances, right? I'm owned by the Lord. So you start, by 10, start with your 10%, and then as the Lord blesses you, If he blesses you, 
think about giving more. It's up to you, right? It's just, just joyous. It's, it really is, y'all. It's, it's hard to describe if you haven't got in the habit of doing this, but it really is a joy. It's really a joy. You should give to the church. 1 Corinthians 16, the Apostle Paul tells the church in, Coloss- or sorry, in Corinth, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia to do, so you are also to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. What happens on the first day of the week in the New Testament? That's Sunday. That's when they gather together for worship. So he's saying bring it together with the church. Pool your resources. That's the idea. Pool your resources. God is, we saw last week in Ephesians, God has given offices to the church, shepherds and teachers, right, to help give you the work of ministry. So, you know, you've got godly men who have been called to help shepherd this congregation who pray over and think over our budget every year to make sure not only are we being faithful, but to continue to seek to be more and more faithful with the money that comes into this church. All right, giving, and that's, that's number five, right? Giving is about more than just money. It's about the heart. It's about the heart. Matthew uh, 23, famous passage where Jesus pronounces the woes, the woes to the Pharisees and the scribes and the, the Sadducees. And one of the woes he pronounces is in verse 23. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Man. What a terrible thing to be called by Jesus. For, why are they hypocrites? For you tithe. Well, okay, are they hypocrites for tithing? No. You tithe mint and dill and cumin. He's taking the smallest spices and you're tithing on them. But you've neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Right? So it's not about whether or not you're tithing. It's about if you have the right heart. What's inside you? And this goes back to what we just saw for the Old Testament concept of tithing. It's because God has covenanted with his people. And now in the New Testament, God's people through Jesus Christ are his church. And so now you give not because it's something you do, but it's because of who you are. This is, onto- this is an, an issue of ontology, they call it. It's your being, right? You, you, you are a part of the church, so therefore you will join in the church. God didn't save part of you, right? When, when he brings you into heaven, he didn't redeem, you know, your upper torso and not your lower torso. He didn't redeem your spirit and not your soul. He didn't redeem your body but not, you know, who you really are. He redeemed all of you. He gave all of himself to you. He didn't, part of Jesus didn't die on the cross for you. Part of the Holy Spirit was not given to you. He, he, he gave you the totality of who he was, right, that you could handle, that, 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 that was meant for salvation. So we give all of ourselves, and he didn't just do it for the individual. He did it for his whole church, the covenant people of God. Therefore, we covenant together not only in the mission of God, but in our supplying for the mission of God. Just like we saw back in Ephesians 4, right? Who was it that is doing the work of ministry? He gave the pastors, or the shepherds and the teachers to equip the saints, that's you, for the work of ministry. My job is to help you do what God gave you to do. My job is to take the money that we all bring into the storehouse and help make sure it's used so that you can do the ministry you see this it's 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 a beautiful beautiful picture remember what we looked at last week in ephesians um when we talked about the trinity and the eternal nature of god and eternal love and peace and joy that exists within god himself And we said we've been adopted into that. The Apostle Paul said that in Ephesians 1. We've been adopted into that perfect relationship that is God. And remember that picture we we used where you were out in the dark and you were out in the cold and you were hungry and you were alone in your sins and you were 
You were desolate. You were out there to die, to perish, just like we all should because of our sins. But then there was the light on inside with this perfect, this picture perfect family by the warmth of the fire, enjoying food, enjoying great fellowship. And, and who was it that got up from the table? But the Son, Jesus Christ Himself, who came and opened the door and grabbed you by the arm and brought you in. And he said, I want you to have a share in my portion. I want you to eat my food. I want you to sit at my table. I want you to enjoy my heat. I want you to be illuminated by my light out of the darkness. I want you to be in my family. That's who you are, Christian. And because that's who you are, then you do out of what you are. You give the way God gave. God loved the world that he gave everything he possibly could. He gave his son. Because you've been remade in the image of Jesus Christ and you seek to love like Jesus Christ loves and you seek to give for the sake of his church. Ephesians 5 says Jesus Christ was sacrificed because he loves his church so much. We love his church so much that we want to join in together with other believers and we want to see Christ's mission spread. Y'all, from First Baptist Woodbridge to one point on a map, radiating all the way to the ends of the earth. And so we pool our resources. That was, that's what we do. <clears throat> Why do we give? It's because of who we are. It's because we've been made to be in Christ. How do we give? We bring it together here in the church. That brings us to obstacle number two. And that is even good Christians, sometimes we get scared. We get scared to give. <clears throat> um, living is expensive. And many of you have already got your budgets laid out. Y'all are type A people. I know how y'all work. And probably there's not a line item in your budget for in case God asked me to give or to give more. Right? So that means when you start thinking about giving to the Lord's work, it means that something, you're going to have to take away from something. All right? Now, 10%, we're not talking about you, the difference between you being inside a house and outside a house. We're talking about the difference between you having, you know, Netflix and Hulu and, you know, Amazon Prime. You can get, a, you can get rid of, it's going to cost you, okay? That's what I'm trying to say. And that's scary. That's scary. So let me put you at ease a little bit. What did the Apostle Paul say in Philippians 4? He said, you're going to be taken care of. God's going to take care of your needs. And this is Paul in prison. And he uses his famous verse, Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And we know what that verse is about, right? Shooting three throw, free throws. That, that when we quote that, quote that verse... Right, we can win this game. No, Paul's using that to say, whether I have much or whether I have little, whether I'm in jail or whether I'm out of jail, whether I'm abased or whether I'm bound, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so with that idea in mind, you go into verse 14 where he's talking about the share, how the, the, the church in Philippi shared together in his suffering, and then you get down to verse 19 and he says, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. He says, you're doing the right thing. You're trying to be generous with what you got. God's going to take care of you. But you need to understand, he's going to supply every need of yours. <laughs> that last part of the verse is important according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. He's not going to supply every need of yours according to your desire to drive a Ferrari. Not saying you can't drive a Ferrari necessarily. You, you, I'd probably take some convincing. <laughs> but it's not for your pleasure necessarily. It's because you belong to him. It's because of who you are. And he's saying, if you will trust me in who you are, then you get to live as who you are. And that is live for the glory and the riches of God Almighty. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of you. Don't worry. Listen, I know it's scary. I know it is. And it's not a one-time thing either. You know, Jennifer and I, we decided a long time ago we were going to be faithful with our money. We're going to give this amount of money to the Lord. 
And later on, we say, you know what? I think we got a little bit more than we need right now. I think it may be time to start looking at giving a little bit more to the Lord. And we're saying, yeah, but we got this coming up, and we got kids now in, the, in college, and da 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 da. I say, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. But I think it's time. I think it's time to start thinking about how we can give more and help more. And it can be scary. He's going to take care of you. And then here's something to let you off the hook a little bit, right? That's that the faithful give from what they have, either in their abundance or in their poverty. So you see in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, he's talking to the church in Corinth. He's talking about the church in Macedonia. And he says, for in a severe test of affliction, their, uh, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord. So the, these churches in Macedonia, they didn't have tons to give, but they gave out of what they could. All right? Y'all, there's people in this room that, you know, we've, we've got a debt. We're still paying a debt on this building. And there's people in this room, you could write 100,000 100, plus dollars right now and still go out to eat lunch today and, and not even think about it. That's because that's the way God just happened to bless you. Um, for me, if, if I pledged $100,000 to pay for this, it's because I just robbed somebody. Right? I, don't, I don't have it. it. No matter how generous I am, that's not something I can give. But I can give according to what the Lord has put in my hands. You see this? So some of y'all have a lot. Maybe you feel generous to give a lot. Some of you have a little. Maybe you feel generous to give you know, according to what you have. Um. But just don't forget what you're giving toward. And be generous. Be generous to give. It's a, it's a fantastic thing to do. I've said it three times already. Now, as we are looking at this idea of giving out of our generosity, um, there's a third obstacle. And this third obstacle is the tough one. Because we love, all of us, we love to think, well, the only reason I didn't give is because I didn't know how or why. Or maybe I'm just not giving because I was a little scared. But there's a third way, right? The third obstacle is this, is that some people aren't giving just because they're refusing. Right? They, they, they know they ought to give. They know they ought to get past their fear, but they're just saying, nope, I'm not going to do it. And, and, and there's really, from what I can count, there's two types of people who might do this. One are those people who think they belong to Christ. The falsely converted. Who can hear the plight of the church globally. And they can hear of the lostness in this world. And they can hear of so many people suffering and dying without the gospel. And they can hear of the opportunities that we have here in, in Northern Virginia to spread the gospel among our neighbors. And they can see there's a need. And they can see they have a way of meeting that need financially. And they're not moved at all. The Bible calls that being hard-hearted. And hard-heartedness usually means that the Holy Spirit has not been active within you. Which means that you're not actually a Christian. If that's you today, I just, I, I'm not trying to give you a hard time. Again, I, I told you this is about more than just giving. This is about understanding who God is and who you are and who you are in relationship to God. So if that's you, I just, I urge you to consider your relationship to Christ. I urge you to consider your own sin and whether or not you've ever truly repented and turned away from your idea of who you are and embraced fully God's idea of who you are, which means you're a sinner that needs to be saved, but Christ came to die for your sins and save you. And today could be the day of your salvation. Your heart could be softened this moment. I mean, you don't have to wait for me to pray with you. You don't have to wait for an invitation. You don't have to wait to go talk to somebody at the Next Step Center afterwards. You write this second in your heart, in your mind. You can call out to the Lord and you can say, I want to belong to you. Save me, God. And the other kind of person that might just refuse to give, I think there are such things as genuine believers who have ignored the teaching of God so much that their consciences are just seared. And they've gotten used to quenching and grieving the Holy Spirit on this matter. 
and you've heard this talk so many times that you've just gotten good at ignoring it. And I'm, I'm, I'm praying for you right this minute that if that is you, you won't ignore it anymore. Because when you grieve the Holy Spirit, it spells disaster in your life. Even if, even if one day you may be accepted in, into heaven by the skin of your teeth, by the grace of God in Christ, you don't want to waste your time on this earth running from him. You say, okay, well, what will happen? What would happen if I'm a Christian and I'm not obedient to give? And, and I'll give you the short version. If you were here in the first service, you got the long version. <laughs> the short version is this. I'm going to quote William Wallace from Braveheart. When they said, well, what happens if we don't go fight against the English and we don't go fight for our freedom? And he says this, nothing. Nothing. What happens if I don't give generously to the church? Best case scenario, nothing. God's purpose, his provision, his peace in your life you're going to miss out on it. All right? The, the idea, the concept of being able to trust your God more than you trust your money, you're going to miss that opportunity. And because, this, because that would make you a believer as a part of this church who is not contributing to this church, this body will suffer. Now, that doesn't mean we'll, we'll stop completely, but we may be like an old pickup truck that's got one spark plug that ain't working. We'll still be able to go. We just can't go as fast or as far because we got dead weight. All right? Don't ride the coattails of the obedient if you're a Christian. Be one of the obedient. Now, I'm not going to end with that. That's your warning. Here's what I'm going to end with. The blessings. The blessings of being faithful to give. And here they are. All right? First of all, I'm going to bring this up. Go ahead and bring up all three of them. There at the end. First of all, you learn that God is greater than your money. All right, I don't have my wallet on me today, but I've got this, and I'm told that this can function as a wallet these days. I'm, I'm not that technologically advanced. But you recognize this thing does not own me. The whole world wants to tell you that you're worth what that number is in your bank account. And you can look them right back in the faith, uh, face and say, not me. I'm worth what God says I'm worth. And he says I'm worth the blood of Jesus Christ, which is, which is so much greater than any retirement plan or 401K or some you know, portfolio that I have in my stocks on this planet. I am not owned by my wallet, says Jesus Christ. We store our treasures in heaven, and we serve one master. We do not serve unrighteous mammon. We do not serve our bank accounts. Freeze you up. Liberating. All right? Second, your focus is turned on what's truly important in this life. In Deuteronomy 14, when he says, bring your tithes and the offerings into the store, or says, bring me your tithes and offerings, your first fruits of your grain, the reason why he says that, he says that you may learn to fear the Lord. Right? Everybody's afraid of something. Am I going to go broke? Am I going to lose my job? Am I not going to be able to buy the most fashionable clothes? Am I not going to get the, the perfect hair and makeup routine? Am I not going to live in the right neighborhood? Am I not going to drive the right car? Everybody's scared of something. I got a better fear for you. Fear the Lord. Trust in Him. Because I promise you, He loves you way more than that car, that house, that 401k, that portfolio, those clothes. And lastly, what do you get? You get to act as a co-worker in the greatest organization of all history, the church. That brings us full circle. God's covenant people. You get to be a part of them. And you're not sitting on the sidelines. Y'all watch football yesterday? You're not sitting up in the stands freezing your rear end off. All right, you're on the field. And you've been made to be on that field. You've been training for this. God prepared you for this. And you're right in there with them, 
on the front lines doing the work of the church not just with your money right it's also with your time and your talent that's who we are it's about more than money remember that it's who you are it's who you are as an event an individual that's who we are together let's pray lord thank you for this word on giving Thank you for what you've given us in your scripture. Help us to be faithful to your scripture, to understand it properly. Lord, help us to be faithful to do what you called us to do, to give joyously and generously, not because we are a mechanical people who just seeks to follow a list of rules, but because it's who we are in our very being, our makeup, remade in Christ, who gave us all. Therefore, we seek to give all because we are in Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.